Good morning, Boker Tov, and welcome back to the Parsha Perspectives for today. I want to thank our generous sponsors, as always, dear friends Becky and Avi Katz, and family in loving memory of Becky's father, David Grossman, David Grossman, Lila Nishmas, David Ben Menachem Manash. Thank you for your generosity. This week we have the privilege of studying Parsha's Vayigash, our story, our gripping story continues to unfold, this narrative. And even though at the end of last week's Parsha, Miketz, the curtain closed with Yehuda already poised and braced to confront and stand up to his brother Yosef. Nevertheless, our parsha begins. Yehuda approached Yosef and he said, If you please, my Lord, may your servant speak a word in your Lord's ears and let not your anger flare up at your servant, for you are like Paro. Micha Mocha. Kefaro, Mika Mocha doesn't mean who, Mika Mocha means you are like Paro. Necham Aleboetz uses this word, word Kamocha in this context to explain a Pasuk later in Sefer Vayikra. We have a mitzvah, Yehafta Lorecha Kamocha. We have an obligation to love our neighbor as ourselves. And famously it's asked, love your neighbor as yourself? How is that possible? How could one love a neighbor as we love ourselves? And so she explained, Look at the words here. Ki kamocha kifaro means you are like paro. Vihafta lorecha kamocha means love what is like you in your neighbor. Everyone can find and see something redeemable in the neighbor. Vihafta lorecha kamocha avas Yisrael. Don't focus on what sets the other person apart. Don't focus on your differences or it will divide. Instead, focus on vihafta lorecha how? Kamocha. Find the kamocha. Ki kamocha ki paro in the other person, and in that way you will connect. Yehuda displays a tremendous amount of courage. He steps up and he confronts Yosef. We mention every year the Ramah, Rav Moshe Isselis and Shulchan Aruch quotes the custom we all have to take three steps forward to begin our Amidah or Shemona Esrei, and he quotes it based on the Rokeach. The Rokeach says, Why do we take three steps forward? Just close your feet, hold them together, and start davening where you are. Picture and imagine yourself standing before the Almighty. Why do you have to take three steps forward? Said the Rokeach, because in Tanakh we have three times the word Vayigash is used to describe stepping up, stepping forward, stepping out, confronting on behalf, advocating, standing up for justice. Avraham, on behalf of Stoom, Vayigash, he steps up to God. Yehuda, Vayigash, I love Yehuda, he steps up to Yosef. And later, Elil Yahuwah Navi with Hara Carmel, when he steps up to the Nevi'e Baal, the false prophets, he steps up in order to stand for God. In Avram's case, he stands up for an enemy. In Yehuda's case, he stands up for a brother. And in Eliyahu's case, he stands up even for God himself. The three steps we take forward to start our Amida correspond with these three Vayigashes. And we too begin our Amida not only focused on ourselves. What do I need? What do I want? What can I get to enrich my life? but to stand up and to advocate for other people. We have in mind that the most authentic form of davening is not only to fulfill our need, but to fulfill the needs of the people around us. Everybody knows it's one of my favorite Divrei Torah. I quote that Ramah in the name of the Rokeach each and every year. So what is it that he says? When Yehuda steps up and confronts Yosef, what does he say? Adoni Shalos Avadav Lehmor, you asked, Hayish Lachem Av Oach, do we have a father and do we have a brother? Which, by the way, should have been some indication why in the world was this Yosef, this viceroy, so obsessed with whether the accused spies and thieves have a father? We told you that we have a father and we have a young brother. We've already lost a brother. He was beloved, he was singular to his mother, and he's gone. And Rashi notes already, is Yehuda lying? That brother's not dead. They knew well and good. They had sold Yosef. So why did he depict it in this way? He was adding to the drama, the suspense, and to how much it would have affected and how much it would have destroyed their father. And we told you, when you said that we had to bring Binyamin down, that we would not be able to return unless we came back with Binyamin, we said, are you crazy? If we take Binyamin from our father, he will surely die. If he leaves our father, he will surely die. The great Tzadik Rabbi Yisrael of Mudjitz said, is a musr. It's a very strong and powerful lesson for each and every one of us. Do you know how we achieve life, life in this world and immortality in the next, when we attach ourselves to Avinu, Avinu Shabashimayim? When we're connected to our Father, when we seek to bring Nachas Ruach to Hashem, when we listen to His expectations of us, when we embrace His, feel, his love and we reciprocate it to Him. But what happens, he writes, Rabbi Yisrael of Machitz, 
אין נמוכה משום אופן לעזוב את זה שבשמיים. אם יכריך עושה לו אמיר, אז דעתו חלילה, ויעזוב את אביו, if we abandon our father, if we walk away from Yiddishkeit, from Judaism, if we stop to embrace its timeless messages for us, ומייס, we will surely die. We have to מוכן ולמסור את נפשו על קדוש השם יסברך. He was willing to give his life rather than detach from his father, rather than detach from Hashem. But even without being asked to give up our lives, we have to realize that if we walk away, if we abandon a connection and a loyalty to Hashem, then we will surely die, we cannot sustain, because real life is not just about the heartbeat in our chest, real life is not just about whether anatomically we're alive, real life is about does our life have meaning, does it have purpose, are we fulfilling the very purpose with which we are here, the reason for creation, then we're alive. But, but we have abandoned God, if we abandon that special relationship, then vames, then surely we will die. Torah goes on and continues to tell this story. Yehuda makes this impassioned, this articulate, this compelling, this heartfelt plea. You cannot send us back. You can't send me back without my brother. There's the famous words, many Hasidish Svarim say, that if I go upstairs without my brother, that if I go upstairs without the Na'ar, then... Uh, how can I return to my father without the without the nar? Pasuk memdal perak memdal and pasuk lamed viata kivoi lavdecha avi v'hanar einenu itanu benafsho kshro benafsho. How am I going to come now? How am I going to come to my father? Avdecha, your servant, my father. V'hanar einenu itanu, and I'm not going to come back with Binyamin. I'm not going to bring back the young man. Benafsho kshro benafsho, but his soul is bound up with his life. Now he calls him avdecha. He calls him, your servant, Avi, my father. And the Gemara Tzota tells us that Yosef is criticized. Yosef loses years on his life because Yehuda had to say that in order to be compelling. He had to fight for his life to get Binyamin. But Yosef should have objected. You call my father your servant or my servant? How could you do such a thing? That is, um, that is such a, you're being pogame in the kavod of our father. Yosef should have objected, and he failed to do so, and for that he was accountable. Let's look at our first Eish Tamid of the day. Of Yisrael Meir Druk, it's a wonderful Sefer Eish Tamid that we've been using a lot this year for the Parsha class. And he says the following, Perek Lam Dalet, Pasuk Lamed. He says, Hisna HaGuso She Yosef Im Binyam Im Binyan HaGaviya Meoreres Tamiya Madu HaHoro Lahat Min Ba'am Tachas HaRivya Madu HaHoro Lahaki Voso Be'eretz Mitzrayim Ke'eved why did Yosef specifically plant this goblet in the backpack of his brother Binyamin? Why did he want to make his own brother, the one he shared a father and a mother with, why do you want to make him seem like the guilty party? And why do you want to hold him back and treat him like an Evid? Shuloyalim Yasar Achiv Laerat Kenan that he's not going to ascend with the rest of his brothers. Hello Binyamin, Lo no Laradaim is Man Machiras Achim as Yosef. If anyone was innocent, if anyone deserved to be uh, exonerated. It's Binyamin. Binyamin wasn't even alive when Yosef was sold into slavery. So how could Yosef falsely accuse the very brother who above all is absolutely innocent? Binyamin obviously wasn't a partner, wasn't an accomplice. Binyamin names all ten of his children after Yosef as a reflection of his long of his longing. Of his missing his brother, So here you have Binyamin, the one innocent brother, the one who was not an accomplice, the one who didn't know or participate in his own sale. Here you have Binyamin, the one who misses Yosef. So genuinely, he names all of his children after Yosef. Each name reflects a different love, a different longing. And that's the brother that Yosef sets up. That's the brother that Yosef falsely accuses. Why? Why was it Binyamin? Avimori Zatzal says, says Rav Druk quoting his father, the Drash Mordechai. Teretz Kush Zushi Yosef Bar Laharus Laachim Shlokech Hu Yelat Sheachin Lo Yaavo BeKapav UMisNahigim O Kefish Nahigim O Bechtei LaHatzim Es Kush Yaso Klape Aachim Shrei Kain His Nahagu Klapav Kasher Machru Oso Mitzrayim. The same innocence that Binyamin had, and the same authentic love that Binyamin had, said Yosef is what I had. Yosef does all of this to orchestrate the very same circumstance from earlier on to know, had his brothers changed? Had his brothers repented? Did they do tshuva gemura? Did his brothers learn the lesson? And they were ready to behave differently. Here you take the one brother who shares a father and a mother. He's the closest to him. The Rambam writes, what's tshuva? Tshuva is when we distance ourselves from the circumstances and the people and the temptation. We live with regret and remorse and a pledge and a promise not to repeat. That's tshuva. But the Rambam says, what's tshuva gemura? What is complete or absolute tshuva? 
when we're back in the exact same circumstances and yet we behave entirely differently. Same circumstances, same temptation. We have the same level of energy and drive and yet this time we say no. That's tshuva gemura. That's complete tshuva. So Yosef orchestrates and choreographs things to be exactly the same. His brother has the same father and the same mother. Such similarity. He's absolutely innocent and he's falsely accused. Will they stand up? Will they intervene? Will they be there for a brother in a way that they weren't for him? That will reflect the tshuva gemura that will make Yosef realize that they've changed, that they're worthy of his forgiveness, that they're worthy of reconciliation and of moving on. They, they put Binyamin on their shoulders and they said, if you indeed stole, what a humiliation, what embarrassment to your father, to your mother. And where's Binyamin? Why didn't Binyamin turn to his brothers and say, hey guys, this is a setup. I'm falsely accused. I've been set up. I absolutely did not steal. I don't know why this viceroy is doing this. While the brothers are themselves castigating, while they're criticizing Binyamin, why didn't Binyamin defend himself? And why didn't he say this whole thing is a ruse? It's a false accusation. Ubir Bizaavi Mori, he quotes his father, the Drash Mordechai, and he explains that what? Imaya Binyamin Amar Sheinoganov, Haimashmos Midar Shemodu Bikach, Sheimoganov Tahi. Because they said, you know, your mother, remember, he was the only other one. Yosef was gone. The only other one that descended from Rachel. And the brothers say, you're a thief. You stole just like your mother. You're no different than your mother because your mother stole the truffin from her father. So just like your mother Rachel stole the truffin from her father, you've stolen this gavia and you've compromised us all. Had Benjamin said, I'm innocent. What are you talking about? That's absolutely not me. In contrast, it would have sounded like he was saying, I'm innocent, but I concede, I admit, my mother in fact was a thief. And he didn't want to do that. And therefore, he remained absolutely silent in order to protect the reputation of his mother. The reputation of his mother. Okay. Um, he has a lot more on this, but let's keep going. Let's keep going. So Yosef is listening to the heartfelt pleas of, of Yehuda. He sees the brothers are different. Yehuda is no longer silent. Yehuda is stepping up. He's standing out. He's taking risks. He's showing courage. That's Tshuva Gemura. Same circumstance. A brother shares the same father and mother. Same circumstance, innocent, falsely accused. And yet, this time, they're stepping up and they are standing out. So now there's a change of the scene. Of course, Yehuda concludes this with the passage I was looking for before. How could I go to the father and the yet lad will not be with me? And this is the mentality we have to have with Hashem Yisbarach. It's according to the name of many, of many Rebbes. How can we go upstairs to Hashem? And we didn't do all we could for chinach, for Jewish continuity. V'hanar einenu itanu. Eich ela elavi. How will I ascend up to my father? And I don't have the young man. I didn't have a continuity. I didn't pass it or pay it forward. So what happens? Yosef's listening. And he's watching it all unfold. And he's seeing the circumstances that he had choreographed are accomplishing their goal. Yehuda standing up. V'loyachol Yosef l'hisapek l'chol hanitzavim alav. Yosef can't take it. He can't hold back. He can't restrain himself anymore. All those who are standing there. And he says, Everybody, out. Clear the room. And nobody remained with him when Yosef revealed his identity to his brothers. Again, we continue with Rav Druk. And Rav Druk says the following. He quotes Rashi. Rashi says, Yosef couldn't restrain himself in front of all those who were standing there. Lisbol means that Yosef couldn't tolerate. Yosef couldn't bear. Yosef was unable to see that the Egyptians were going to be in the room when he revealed himself and that the Egyptians would be present while the brothers were humiliated, while the brothers were ashamed while the brothers had to confront their own guilt and guilty conscience, Yosef was unable, Yachol is bol. He could not tolerate, he couldn't bear that shame, that embarrassment of his brothers. Says Rav Druk, It's really astounding when you think about it. A lesser person, a lesser person would have said, Embarrass the brothers? Good. Let them be humiliated. Let them be filled with shame. 
Do you know what they did to me 22 years? I've languished. 22 years I've been alone. 22 years I've been isolated. 22 years I've been exiled. Let them be embarrassed. Let them feel shame. The more the merrier. Post it online. Let everybody know what they did. Let everybody see their face when they have to confront the reality. But not Yosef. Yosef says, even these people who did this to me, he was unable, lo yachol he couldn't tolerate he couldn't bear the idea that others would be present when they were confronting their own shame. Uva Medrash Alatar in the Medrash here says, Amr Bichama Brachanina, Lo Asa Yosef Kishura, Shilu Bad Bo Echad Mehem Yahu Mais, Vayolo Lisarem Masa Yishchem. Yosef did something which was terribly irresponsible. Yosef should have known what Levi and Shimon had done to Shechem. This was a violent group. They had the capacity to be violent. What if when Yosef was alone with them, and when he revealed himself to them, maybe they would have attacked. Maybe they would have killed him. Maybe they would have turned violent with him to finish the job they had started 22 years earlier. The Medrash is critical of Yosef. He wasn't entitled to take such a risk, a risk to his life, to be alone with them. He risked everything by being alone and by telling everyone to go outside. And yet he did it. And why did he do it? so as not to embarrass his brothers. You see such a powerful lesson, such a powerful lesson, like Tamar, who didn't embarrass Yehuda. Yosef doesn't want to embarrass the brothers. Many of us, we live in a time that people will put their desire for revenge, their pursuit of honor, their ego, ahead of, ahead of the value of not embarrassing someone else. Let them be embarrassed. Let everyone see their shame. But even Yosef, who was the victim, Yosef, who was the aggrieved, Yosef, who was the innocent party, he's so committed to not embarrass a brother, a fellow Jew, that he's even willing to take a risk of his life to be alone, to be alone with them. He wanted to reveal his identity earlier. He had to so show some self restraint. He had to hold back. He waited patiently. Why the Torah have those words? They seem totally gratuitous, extraneous. And Yosef couldn't restrain himself anymore. Okay, just tell us that he revealed himself. It was the big reveal. Why does it have to be set up, that he was unable to restrain himself? Because it's telling us, it was all to not embarrass his brothers. That's what it means he couldn't restrain even when it comes to the brothers who sold him down the river, who sold him into slavery, who exiled and dismissed him, he still was overprotective of an enemy. Judaism says even somebody who's harmed us or injured us, we're not entitled to take revenge, and nor should we have, what's the great German word? Scheidenfreund, I forgot the word. You're not supposed to take pleasure in their sadness. You don't take pleasure in their suffering. Yosef, a lesser person, would have taken pleasure in their shame. Get everyone, bring the news cameras, press conference, live stream. We're going to broadcast to the world when I reveal myself. Let everyone see their guilt, their shame, their shock. Yosef's the opposite. Even though he couldn't hold himself back anymore, he held himself back for one more moment. How long? Until he cleared the room in order to protect and preserve his brother's honor and their dignity. We see Messias Nafsha Shal Yosef. We see the mysterious nefesh, to not embarrass, to not embarrass another person. A very, very powerful, very powerful image. And now Yosef is ready for the big reveal. Perak Memei, Pasuk Gimel. Famously, he turns to them and he says those words, Vayomer Yosef elachav ani Yosef ha'od avichai. He says, I am Yosef, ha'od avichai, is my father still alive? V'leyechlu echav la'anososo, ki nifhalu mipanav. I am Yosef, is our father still, is my father still alive? And the brothers couldn't answer. They were shocked. They were startled. They couldn't answer. He said, come closer, don't worry. I'm not going to bite. I'm Yosef, your brother. It's me, Yosef, don't you recognize me? I know I have the beard and I've aged. I'm wearing some Egyptian clothing, but it's me, Yosef, your brother. I'm the one you sold. Don't you remember? Don't you remember? So what does it mean, wonders, Rav Druk? Go on Rav Druk, all in on Rav Druk today. What does it mean, one does Rav Druk? Why does Yosef repeat himself twice? First he says, Ani Yosef. And Chazal, our rabbi, say from here, Oy li yom adin, oy li yom 
Woe unto us the day of rebuke when we come upstairs and we meet our maker after 120 years and God is going to say, Ani Yosef. What's the Ani Yosef moment? The brothers, the 22 years all came into focus. They had practiced some cognitive dissonance. They hadn't thought about what they had done. They had divorced themselves from those actions because their, their conscience could tolerate it so that they would be able to manage a coping mechanism. But now 22 years later it was undeniable. Yosef held up this big mirror for them to look at. Ani Yosef. Here I am, the one you're groveling to, the one that you need. My dreams have come true. You're bowing down to me. And those two immortal words, iconic words, Ani Yosef, it was the ultimate of rebuke. And we're told this is what it will be like for us, Ani Yosef. When we get upstairs, Hashem will make us watch a video of our lives and we'll see everything the way it comes together. And it's undeniable. HaRachayim Tamad, HaRachayim wonders, Madu Yosef Chazor Shuv Lamani Yosef. When he reveals himself, he says, I'm Yosef. Why did he say, Why didn't he say, Why didn't he say, Is our father alive? Why does he say, Is my father alive? But moreover, what a bizarre question. In Yehuda's plea, what is the basis of Yehuda's entire argument to Yosef? His whole argument is, You're going to kill our father. Our father was still alive. He's already lost one son. And he begged us not to bring down his other son, Binyamin. And if we, How can I go back to my father without the Na'ar? So it was unequivocally clear. Yehuda had said over and over again. The assumption in his argument was, My father, my father, my father, my father. Yosef reveals himself and he says, Fellas, Yosef, is my father still, is my father still alive? He just finished telling you all about his father. So I think perhaps what Yosef was saying was, not ha'ud avinu chai, is our father still alive? That was clear. They had already indicated that their father was very much alive, but he wouldn't live long unless they brought back the brother. But that wasn't Yosef's question. It wasn't ha'ud avinu, is our father? It's ha'ud avi, is my father. The one who loved me, longed for me, favored me, gifted me that colored coat, the one who I learned with, my mentor, my teacher, my everything. Does he miss me? Has he been consoled? Has he been comforted? Has he grieved and moved on? Has he forgotten? Or has he remained inconsolable? Ha'ud avi, is my father still alive? But the Orachayim is bothered. He begins his revelation by saying, Ani Yosef, ha'ud avi chai. And then what does he say when they are shocked? Vayomer Yosef alachav, kshunai, like come close. Ani Yosef achichem, I'm your brother Yosef. And the Orachayim wonders, why does he have to repeat himself? I'm Yosef, I'm Yosef, od tama. And moreover, First time he says, I'm Yosef. And the second time he says, Ani Yosef Achichem. I'm Yosef, your brother. What did he add by throwing in your brother? O Tamua, and moreover, why does he have to remind them as if he has to identify himself to them? I'm Yosef. I'm Yosef, your brother. I'm Yosef, your brother, you know, the one you sold into slavery. Why didn't he just the very first time say, Ani Yosef? Why didn't he include it the first time? Why does he incrementally do it in stages? First, I'm Yosef. Then I'm Yosef, your brother. Then I'm Yosef, your brother, the one you sold. Good. So says Rav Druk, near Levair, He really wanted to first rebuke them for the fact that they sold a brother into slavery. How could brothers do that to a brother? So that Musr, you know, sometimes the harshest thing in the world is the reality you face. You don't need an elaborate, elaborate speech. You don't need an entire dissertation. All you need is to face the reality of what you have. And that is the biggest Musr that there is. That's the biggest Musr. But the Amr Gemara that so when he says Ani Yosef, they're so embarrassed, they're so humiliated by confronting what they had done, that humiliation, that shame, that embarrassment is the kapara. They're forgiven. So now he repeats Ani Yosef Achichem, he adds your brother, Shechazra Ha'achva. Now that you've been forgiven, Achichem. Now can we re- now we can restore a sense of brotherhood a sense of camaraderie. I am Yosef, not just I am Yosef, and now you face the reality of what you had done and before whom you stand. I am Yosef, your brother. Now we can have brotherhood, camaraderie. Now we can have a sense of unity. 
And now Rabbi Yosef Hosif Lomar, and he adds on, Hashem you sold me, as the Sfas Emes explains, Shekavanos Hohais Al-Derech Shomer Chazal, Asher Shibarta, Yashikoach Shashibarta. The very end of the Torah, when Hashem is recounting and recalling that Moshe broke the Luchos on Har Sinai, it says, the Luchos Asher Shibarta, the tablets that you broke, and we are encouraged, Chazal say, read it, Asher Shibarta, Yashikoach. Hashem gave Moshe a big Yashikoach, Shkoyach, that you broke the Luchos. Similarly here, Yosef is comforting his brothers and he's saying, Asher macharta mosi, yasher kochachem she macharta mosi. Shkoyach that you sold me. Shkoyach! You thought you were doing something harmful. You thought you were going to take revenge against me. You thought you were punishing me. You thought you were finally getting rid of me. But it turns out you get a big yasher koach. Because what you set in motion was my rising to the Viceroy of Egypt. My saving the economy and saving my family. What you set in motion was the Jewish people coming down to Egypt and ultimately coming out a nation. So therefore, he's giving them a big yashikoach. So when he says it the first time, on Yosef, it's Musr. And they're so ashamed and humiliated and guilt-ridden that they achieve mechila just through that sense of shame. And now that they're forgiven, he says, on Yosef, achichem. Now that you're forgiven, now that you've experienced the shame that is a kapara, that's atoning, now I can reveal as your brother. Now we can have a sense of brotherhood. Now we can connect. And I want you to know, not only do I, not only am I willing to reconcile, not only am I willing to have Ava v'yachva, but Hashem achartem, yashikoach shem I can even look back at my life and say, shkoyach, thank you. In fact, it wasn't a harm, it was a favor. The fact that you sold me set in motion an amazing string of events that I really needed, and for that, I am so grateful. And that's what he continues, Rav Druk, with a similar theme that I want to bring to your attention. Perak me pasuk hey. He continues, Joseph, and he says, Vyata and now, I'll te'atzvu. Don't be sad. And don't be angry in your eyes that you sold me here. Because God sent me here in order to get provisions. He sent me ahead of the way so that I'd be in the right place at the right time in order to do this for you. Rashi says, I'm here to save you. I'm here to sustain you. So Rav Druk is bothered. I'm doing a lot of Rav Druk. I told you all in on Rav Druk today. We've got plenty of us as well. But Rav Druk is bothered. What was Yosef thinking when he says, don't be sad, and don't be upset, and don't have regret. Thank you for selling me, because that set in motion my rise. Look how great things are. Yeah, the last 10 years were wonderful. The last 10 years, he's the vice president of the country. The last 10 years, he's the second most powerful man in the world. The last 10 years, he's the hero of Egypt. But what about the 12 years prior? The 12 years before those, he sat unjustly languishing in prison. He suffered all kinds of indignities, false accusations. He suffered the relentless pursuit of this woman. So I understand that you could thank them. Do you know? You thought you were getting even with me? Guess what? For 10 years, I've lived in a palace. I've been the vice president. For 10 years, I've been the second most powerful man. I've had all the wealth and riches. I got married. I had children. Everything's been geschmack. But what about the 12 years prior? How could he say Yashikach for selling me when the first 12 years, he sat languishing, suffering in prison? Had he been sold, and the moment he arrived in Egypt, he ascended to that level of leadership, I would understand why he expressed that level of gratitude. How could you be so grateful for being sold when before you could experience the rise, he first had this enormous fall of 12 years of suffering. And he explains Rav Druk. Hanir Levar Bezat, listen carefully, I love this pshat. It's so important. Because in Parshas Miketz it says, Yosef hu al Yosef It says that Yosef rose to take care of the underprivileged and the destitute, those who are hurting and those who are hungry. Yosef is Yosef saw his brothers. How did he see his brothers? He wasn't hiding in the palace. He didn't have layers of gatekeepers protecting him. He was on the line in the soup kitchen. He was spooning it out. He was shoveling it out. Yosef was himself giving out the food. That's how he knew and recognized his brothers when they came and they were in line. So if you think about it, why was he in work in the soup kitchen line? Says Rav Druk, listen to this insight. Yosef looks back at his life and he says, you know what put me in a position 
to have empathy and sympathy. You know what put me in a position to care for and to take care of the underprivileged and the hungry and the indigent of Egypt by saving their food and giving them those provisions? Because I knew what it meant. I languished 12 years. And those 12 years were tough and I suffered. But you know what? I was better for it because now I could relate and now I could connect. Now I knew what it meant to be hungry. Now I knew what it meant to long for a better future. Now I knew what it meant to wait for somebody to help liberate you and take care of you and relieve your suffering. And because I went through what I went through, says Yosef, even that negative experience taught me and positioned me and enabled me to go through this positive experience of being there for other people. And so when Yosef reflects back on the 22 years, he doesn't divide between 12 miserable years and 10 good years. He sees that as one unit, as one package deal. 22 years, Yashikoach Hashem Machartem. Thank you for selling me. And first for 12 years, I got an education and empathy. I knew what it meant to suffer so that the next 10 years, I was a better giver. I was a better doer. That's what it meant. So Yosef was grateful even for the first 12 years because it made him better. And that's what he tells them. Don't be sad. Not just the 10 years when he was in charge was for the purpose of, of helping. Even the 12 years of languishing in prison, he learned from it. It made him a better person. Someone just sent me today, I saw an amazing story about a businessman in Florida who pays overdue utility bills for dozens of Floridians. This is not the first time. Mike Esmond walked into the city hall in Gulf Breeze, Florida, did it for the first time November 2019, and he cut a check for $4,300 to pay for 36 local residents whose gas and water bills were overdue and at risk of being disconnected. And just now, this month in December, Mr. Edmund, the same guy, is 74 years old. He owns a construction company. He wrote another check, $7,600. He walked in, he said, I want to pay off the balance for residents whose gas and whose water is about to be shut off. And this time that money covered 114 residents that he was able to take it up. Why did he do it? Where did it come from? So he explained, it's amazing. He told the story that after Hurricane Sandy struck, a local company offered him that help. He had hit hard times and he had three good young girls at home at the time. Temperature was low. He talked about, uh, I'm sorry, going back to the winter of 1983 when he was broke and his own gas and water service was shut off for the holidays. He said he had three young girls at home at the time and the temperature got down to six degrees, ice and frost on the inside of the house. I lived that where I didn't have a dollar in my pocket to care for my family. I know what it's like to be really broke and in need and I wanted to see if I could help people that might be experiencing the same thing where they can, couldn't pay their bills and their utilities were going to be shut off and therefore he stepped up and he stepped in to do it. He did it last year, he did it this year and he said, please God, if he should live, he will continue to do it. I saw that story today and it struck me because that's Yosef. Yosef says, you know what, when the water and, and gas were shut off for me, when I was frozen inside my home, it was miserable, but it taught me. I learned from it. I grew from it. And I was able to feel empathy for others because of it. And therefore, I look back at that not with regret, but I look back at that as a learning opportunity. Yosef says, it's not just the last 10 years that have been great. The first 12 years were also great because they positioned me and because I learned from them. Demrechaim. Oh, finally, an Demrechaim. Also these don't be sad and don't have regret and don't be filled with fear because God sent me here ahead of you so that there'd be a plan and I'd be able to sustain you with food. He's comforting his brothers that even though it's because they sold him, it began this exile in Egypt. But nevertheless, don't be sad. Don't make yourself his satsev, hit pael. Don't make yourself sad. Why? Means, don't have regret. You know why? Because had you not sold me into slavery in Egypt, the Jewish people would never have Pesach. We'd never have shlachani, shilchan, a halig, a seder tish. We'd never have a seder. We'd never tell that story. We'd never have that family narrative. We'd never know the experience of the transition from Golos to Geula, from Avdus to Cheres. We'd never know it. So therefore, don't be sad, because this was the necessary prerequisite. These were the necessary circumstances that ultimately would lead to a 
Yitzias Mitzrayim, the ten plagues, and the splitting of the sea, and Kilimechia Shlachani, Shlachani Milashan Shulchan, the Helege Seder Tish. In Maosios Gematria Pesach, Shlachani Elokim Lafnechem, is Gematria Pesach Matzah Umor. Shetizko Ayideha Yeridel Mitzrayim, they merited by descending down to Egypt, Keshetetsu Mimena when they left the Chag Pesach, but Tochlu in Pesach Matzah Umor. Vizela Michia, Michia Nefashos Vikidish Hashem. The Michia, the nourishment and the sustenance for our soul, is the Hele Gesedr Tish, is the holiday of Pesach. And there would be no Pesach if we never ended up in Egypt. And we never would have ended up in Egypt if not for their selling Yosef. What an ability to spin. Yosef is able to look back on his life, not with anger, not with resentment, not of what if. Yosef looks back at his life and he says, Baruch Hashem, thank you for it all. Yashikoach, don't feel bad. Don't worry, it was all part of a master plan. It's all what brought me down here. And that's a good thing that shouldn't leave you filled with any sense of regret. Perak Memhei, Pasuk Yud. Hold on, we're not leaving the Emre Chaim yet. Perak Memhei, Pasuk Yud. He tells them, Yashav Tebaretz Goshen Vaisa Karav Elai, Atav Anachav Anei Vanacha. Don't worry, send for everybody else. Bring the nieces and nephews. Go get Tati, go get Abba, go get Yaakov. You're going to live in Goshen. And you and your children, your families, your cattle, all of it is going to live in Goshen. Perak Memei Pasuk Yud says the vision of Tzurebbe. I lost the place. The Yashav to Beretz Goshen. Eretz Romez La'anava. The word Eretz, earth, the ground, the soil. Eretz is a reference to humility. Menafshi ka'afar la'kol tiyeh. And Geshen, Goshen is Gematria Simcha. Then Homiletically, I'll be drush what the vision of the Rebbe says. Hashem is saying, if you live, if you see yourself as low to the ground, if you're humble and you're modest and you have humility, then Goshen is Then you'll live with Simcha. You want joy? Don't pursue honor. Don't be have an inflated ego. Live with humility and live with modesty, and then Vaisa Kurovelai, that is the mechanism and that is the means to draw close to Kadish Baruch to Hashem. Perak Memhei, Pasak Yud Gimel. Continuing right along. So go back. Go tell Dad all the honor I get here in Egypt. I'm an influencer. I'm a person of prestige. It's Kola Shiri Isam, everything you saw. Umihartem and Hari and bring my father down here. Go and quickly get him. So what does he say? Go tell our father of all the kavod. Says the Vishnitzer, You could read the word kvodi as, Go tell our father, my father, all the honor I've earned. I'm the vice I'm the vice president, I'm the second in command. That's the simple meaning. All the honor I have. And where the Vishnitzer says, don't Miloshan Kvodi as honor, but Miloshan Kvedus as heavy and weighty. You know how difficult it was for me being here in Egypt, being a foreigner in this land? It was difficult. It was hard. It's not who I it's not who I am, and it's not what I'm about. Perak Memhe Pasak Chaf He. Continuing, he sends them back. He sends them back and he says, don't delay on the way. By Alum and Mitzrayim, they go out from Egypt. By Olav, it's Canaan, Yaakov, Avim, and they come to Canaan to their father. And what does they say? By Yigidul, they more old Yosef Chai. They say Yosef's still alive. Fachil Moshem Lucharis Mitzrayim. He's in charge. They have figli bo kilohemin lahem. And Yaakov almost has a heart attack. He doesn't believe it. He doesn't believe it. So says the Mayan Beis Hashoeva. Says Rav Schwab the following. What do you mean he didn't believe it? Let's talk about this for a moment. Pasuk says that the brothers come up and they say, Abba, Dad, crazy story. You're not going to believe it. Yosef's still alive. He's the one we've been telling you about. He orchestrated it all. And he's Yosef. He's alive. Come. And Yaakov says, I don't believe it. He almost paints, faints. He almost passes out. He almost has a heart attack. Rashi Chazal tells us, Serach Bas Usher has to play the harp and break it to him slowly and gently. And he says, I don't believe it. So what are the Vaidabru Elav is called Divera Yosef, Ashadivera Lehem. So they repeat everything that Yosef had said. And Vayaras Agalos, and only when he sees now the wagons, Asher Shalach Yosef Laseso, so Vatachi Ruach Yaakov Avim. When Yaakov sees the wagons that Yosef had sent to get him, now Yaakov comes alive. He's no longer faint, he's no longer having a heart attack, he comes, he comes alive. 
Why did he doubt them? Why didn't he believe them? And why does he have to be able to come alive? So Rav Schwab says, at the beginning when they say, Od Yosef Chayv, he's still alive, he wonders, what do you mean? You brought me the coat. It was covered in blood. You testified that he died. What do you mean? They had not yet told them that it was a ruse, that they had lied to say that he was attacked by an animal. This is the punishment of a badai, that even when he's saying the truth, they don't, they don't listen to him. Hold on one moment. So they hadn't yet told him that they were responsible, and in fact, he hadn't killed anybody, but they had sold him. So the second time when they tell him, says Rav Schwab, If they try to cover up their lie and what they had done, they won't succeed. They had to reveal the truth. They had to tell him that they had in fact sold him and asked for forgiveness. So they told over everything about Yosef. In other words, for Yaakov, it didn't add up. What do you mean Yosef's still alive? You brought me the coat. It was covered in blood. You said he was killed. What do you mean it doesn't add up? And that's when they said no. They repeated everything that Yosef said. And what was one of the things Yosef said? He said, Ani Yosef, I'm Yosef Hashem Machartem. I'm the Yosef that you sold. They came clean. Now this is a very big question. The text itself never tells us. The narrative of the Torah never tells us. Did the brothers tell Yaakov? Did Yosef tell Yaakov? We know that Yosef never was alone with Yaakov because he didn't want Yaakov to ask him what happened. He was continuing to protect the dignity and honor of his brothers. But according to Shwab, they did come clean. And they came clean, that's why at first Yaakov didn't believe them. And only after they came clean and completed the picture, only then did they understand, and only then did Yaakov believe. The Ishtamid also has an approach to what is going on over here. Rav Druk also uh, deals with this question. And he says, what, what happened at first? Why didn't Yaakov not believe the brothers? Does he think his children are liars? These are the Shivte Ka. This is the, the tribes, the holy Jewish tribes. And is this a way to play? He thought his sons were lying? And did he think they were lying to the point that they come and they, and they fake? And they say, you're Yosef, who you miss, who you've been inconsolable over. That Yosef's still alive. Ha ha, just kidding, just joking. So what was Yaakov thinking? Would he accuse them of lying? Did he think they were joking? What's going on over here? Why would they do that? Why would they do that? And he goes on with his questions. But he answers the following. Why do these agalos, the wagons that he sees, what happens? They say Yosef's alive. He says, I'm having a heart attack, I don't believe you. Only then he sees the wagons coming to get him. And he says, ooh, the wagons are coming. And they repeat everything about Yosef. And he says, I'm alive. I believe it now. Let's go. What is it about the wagons? So we all know, we all know the story, that the wagons were um, a reference to the very last thing they were learning together. They were learning the sugi of Egla Arufa, the story of when a corpse is found between cities and we don't know where the murderer comes from, and the elders of the city have to come and measure, and have to take an atonement, they snap the neck in a valley, all story of the Egla Rufa. That was the sugya that they were learning. When Yaakov saw the wagons, it was an embedded message. It was a signal that Yosef was saying, I am still alive. And Yaakov knew that, and that's why he believed them, and that's why he went. But says Rav Druk, it goes much deeper than that. And it's really much more than that. What's really going on over here? When Yaakov doesn't believe them, it's not that he doesn't believe that Yosef is alive physically. He believes Yosef is alive physically. What doesn't he believe? He doesn't believe that Yosef is still alive spiritually. He says, Yosef's the viceroy? Yosef's the vice president? Yosef is saved and he's in charge of the entire economy? Can't be. He can't still be a religious person. He can't still be a Shomer Shabbos. He can't still be a link in the chain of my legacy. Can't be. And when he sees the Agolim and he says, Yosef understands, no. You see, if I assimilated, if I intermarried, if I had moved on, then I would never remember or reference the last sugya we had been learning. The fact that 22 years later, I remember what we were learning means I am still that person that you left 22 years ago. And that was the signal, that was the hint. That's what gave Yaakov the confidence that indeed Yosef was still alive. He wasn't worried about Yosef being alive. Um, he wasn't worried about Yosef being alive physically. 
He was worried about Yosef being alive spiritually, and the Agalos were that message that he indeed was. Rabbi Soloveitchik also addresses the question of the of the wagons. And what was the message embedded in the wagons? Listen to what Rabbi Soloveitchik says. Why did Yaakov overcome his initial skepticism only after he had seen the wagons? Rashi suggests that as evidence that it was indeed Yosef who sent the message, Yosef instructed the brothers to tell Yaakov that at the time he left, they were studying the laws of Egla Arufa. The phrase should be interpreted as, and he saw the calves that Yosef had sent, since in reality the wagon themselves were sent by Paro, not by Yosef. The law of Egla Arufa involves the Jewish concept of a leader's responsibility. In the event of an unsolved murder, the elder of the city that is close to the corpse is obligated to bring a, hef- a heifer into a rough valley or brook. There they break the neck of the heifer and they say, Our hands have not shed this blood. The Mishnah raises the question, the Mishnah in Sota, is it conceivable these venerable elders would actually shed blood? Instead, what the Torah means is that the elders of the community did not send this wayfarer away without food, nor did they allow him to leave the community unaccompanied. It is almost frightening to consider, listen carefully, it's almost frightening to consider how much the Torah demands of the leader. Obviously, the leader is responsible for his actions. His judgment must be proper. He must not accept bribes. He must act in accordance with the principles of justice and charity. In addition, however, the leader is also charged with responsibility for people and events which seem far removed from his concerns. And this, this is the message of the Egla Rufa. Yaakov knew that Yosef was destined for power. And that's why he was studying the morality of leadership and the power with Yosef. Says the Rav Egla Rufa was not a random sugya. It wasn't a random topic they happened to be learning. And now 22 years later, Yosef is referencing it as the signal that he's still from, that he's still, that he's still uh, Erlich. No! The sugya, the topic of Egla Rufa, is a topic of leadership. The morality of leadership. The value and the virtue, the responsibility of leadership. And, and Yaakov was preparing Yosef for that life of leadership because he knew the life Yosef was destined to live. And Yaakov was now trying to determine if both his son and his disciple were still alive. A ruler of Egypt, he thought, must certainly be assimilated into the general pagan society. Yaakov could not believe that Yosef had, had preserved his spiritual identity and remained loyal to the teachings he had observed in Yaakov's household. Now, when the brothers related the last lesson Yaakov and Yosef had shared together, he realized that Yosef remained his disciple as well as his son. Great insight of Rabbi Soloveitchik, that the Egla Rufa is not a random topic. Egla Rufa is a topic of leadership. And Yosef is showing the fulfillment, the realization of their learning together. Dad, I'm a leader. And I'm not just a secular leader. I'm a leader dad who is living with moral leadership, with Jewish leadership, with the leadership that you taught me to live with. That's who I, that's who I am, and that's what I am about. All right, continuing. A couple more quick ideas. Perak Mem Vav, Pasuk Chavzayin, we just did, the Agalos. Perak Mem Vav, Pasuk. Let's do this one. We'll do two more that I love. Perak Mem Zayin, Pasuk Aleph. The Torah continues and it tells us, Yosef comes to Paro and he tells him that uh, I'm bringing, I'm bringing uh, my father and my brothers and they're coming here to be shepherds. Coming here to be shepherds. Skip down. Yosef settled his father and his brothers, and he gave them property in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, the land of Ramses, as Paro had mandated. Misalovitchik has another great insight here. And he says, Torah knowledge originated on Har Sinai, and it was passed down from one generation to the next. The quintessence of Jewish history is based on the connection between teacher and student, the continuity of the Torah of the Mesorah. This Mesorah requires both the Rav and the Talmud. By their efforts, the Torah survives eternally. There is another Masorah of great significance, the Masorah of Jewish Balabatim, the Masorah of the Jewish lay people. This Masorah is not one of concepts, but rather of methods and images. It is a continuity of a type of personality. The first Balabas was Yosef. In Egypt, he provided support for his father and his brothers. Our survival in Gaulus is due not only to the struggle of Jewish scholar, but also to the efforts of the Jewish Balabas. It's not just the Rosh Hashiva, it's not just the Rav, it's not just the clay Kodesh, who those who work in the area of Kodesh but it is the Balabatim who support, who underwrite, who bring their wisdom and their partnership. There are three characteristics that Balabatim possess which make them unique rights to Rav. First, the Balabais feels a clear awareness of his responsibility not only for himself, but for the entire Jewish community. Second, the Balabais has a pragmatic mind. He has an aptitude for decision-making 
and decision executing. And finally, the Balabais is a visionary. He's a dreamer. He looks to the stars from whom were these traits inherited from the very first Jewish Balabais, namely Yosef. How did the Torah portray Yosef? His first dream involved bundles of wheat. He was an individual with a prosaic practical vision. There was another dream, however, of stars in the heavens. Both dreams were found in Yosef's personality. He was pragmatic, but he also looked to the stars. He was a visionary, imagining the limitless goals that he could achieve in aiding his nation. And so Yosef has both components, both aspects. And this is the lesson of the Balabas. Klai Yisrael needs Klai Kodesh and Le Kodesh. We need those people who dedicate their lives and their career to the service of the community of Hashem. And you need the businessmen and women who are leaders, the lay leaders, who bring their wisdom and their resources, who also are both dreamers and pragmatic. Yosef is the first successful Balabas. He's the vice president of Egypt. He's Balabas, but he remains learned and he's supporting Torah and he's supporting his father and his brothers and their institutions of, of Torah. Last topic, quickly. Paro, when he meets the brothers, he says, No, what's your parnasa? What do you do? And they say, Shepherds. So Paro says, sorry, They say to Paro, We've come to live in the land. Because there's a huge famine where we come from. And now we've come to live here. We say in the Haggadah, from this Pasuk, it teaches that Yaakov did not come down in order to dwell there, but he was passing through. So the question is asked of Druk the following. That they remained in Egypt always as foreigners, as outsiders. It wasn't their place. It wasn't their place. So which is it? On the Pasuk, it seems to be a contradiction. On the one hand, they came Lagur, to live. But to live, Lagur, is like a ger, an outsider, a stranger. But then it says, Yeshvuna. They came as a Toshav, as a Yishuv, as a citizen, as a resident. So which is it? So he says, They came, passed through temporarily, and not to live permanently. That, when it comes to Mitzrayim, which is Erva Sa'aretz, but Goshen, where they set up a Jewish community, Goshen, where they set up a yeshiva, and Batei Medrash, where they came to learn Torah, that they came to dwell. That they didn't have to fear that they were in exile. And Rav Druk develops a very fascinating idea. He says, basically, what does it mean? The Gemara Baruch says that they came to Rabbi Yochan and they said, there's a Canaan, are there old people in Babylon, Babylonia? He said, yes. He said, but the Pasuk said, that the only way to achieve longevity is Allah Adama in the land of Israel. But in Chutz Laaretz, you can't. So I don't understand. So the Gemara says, no, these individuals, because they wake up early to come to the shul and they stay late in the shul, that's why they merited an Arichas Yamim. And the Marsha wonders, you didn't ask the question. The Pasik says that that you only merit longevity on the land, in Israel. Who cares that they wake up and spend a lot of time in shul? How does that help? Sort of Druk, based on this Marsha, develops an idea. I'm going to put it in a little paraphrase terms. But you know how there's a notion of an embassy? We have the concept of an embassy. That the American embassy in Israel has the status of America, the legal, the legal uh, status of America. The Israeli embassy in America has the status of Israel. It's legally as if it's Israel as an embassy in America. When you're in the embassy, it's like you're on the plot of land of Israel. When you're in the American embassy in Israel, it's like you're standing on America. Well, the same is true when it comes to shuls and batei medrash. You could be in Gullus, but do you know how you're in the embassy of the Jewish people? The embassy of Israel. You could be in a foreign land and yet be in a familiar place when you're in a base medrash and you're in a shul. That's how we achieve it. That's how we achieve it. That's where we spend our time. That's what forges our identity. And that's how we can experience a redemptive identity and status even when we're in a foreign place. Have a great day, everybody. Stay happy.